Hello, everybody, and welcome to Larger Stories Book of the Month webinar. I am your host, Kep Crab. And if you're joining us just for the first time today, we've been going through the written works of my late father, Dr. Larry Crab. And this really isn't a, isn't a book review of any kind. We've gone through now several books over the last several months, but it's really more just a discussion about what, how is this book impacting us? What are some of the things that stand out that resonate um, as, we're, as we're talking about these books? Um, it's been the last seven or eight or nine months that we've been doing this, and it's been really fun to reread a lot of my father's material that I haven't read in a while um, and some of his older material. And um, it's really given me a new appreciation for who he was and how the Spirit used him to impact people's lives during his 76-year smaller story. <laughs> um, I've told you before that I've been, I was part of the, the writing process with dad for years, uh, since the early 2000s, right after the book Soul Talk came out, I took the reins of, of taking his handwritten chicken scratch paper. He would fax it to me. I would then put it into an electronic form, fax it back to him. He would then mark it up and redline everything and fax it back to me. After that, for about four or five times, maybe six times, we'd have a chapter. And that's how we did all of the books all the way to the end, um, which was a really important thing for me and one of the most fun things that I've had a chance to do with my dad for sure. But next month, we're actually going to be talking about a book that my mother wrote, the second book that she wrote. It's titled Listen In. I've got a copy of it here. If you need a copy of it, I would encourage you to uh, jump on online at uh, largerstory.com and order this. We would love to send you a copy of Listen In. Uh, Mom had a chance to write this book with two of her friends, and uh, they're going to be joining me on May 26th at four o'clock Eastern time. So join us for the book, Listen In, which is gonna be kind of a little Mother's Day special. I know we've got Mother's Day coming up here in a few weeks. So happy Mother's Day to all you mothers and I uh, hope you all join us for Listen In, May 26th at four o'clock. Today, we're gonna be chatting about uh, a book that my father wrote called A Different Kind of Happiness. And the subtitle of the book is Discovering the Joy That Comes from Sacrificial Love. And he has a, a, a quote in there that I just wanted to read real quick before we get started here. He says in this, in this book, and I don't know where, what, about halfway through the book or so, he says, more than once, many more times, I have wept with anticipated joy as I have imagined myself actually meeting Jesus and hearing him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, he's done that now. And during the last few weeks of his life, the only time that he would get really emotional and weep, I think was the right word, is when he would talk about when he was going to, to see Jesus. And uh, man, I can't wait till that's said to me someday. That'll be fun. Today, we're going to be talking about the book, Different Kind of Happiness. I'm joined today by my close friend, Anthony Vartuli. Anthony um, and his wife are part of a church group, a small group that my wife and I are part of. Uh, we've got a few other couples in the group, and we've also got a recently widowed woman in our group as well, and they've been our church for the last uh, several months. Um, Anthony served as a spiritual director at our schools of spiritual direction, and Anthony is currently working with Larger Story as a spiritual director as well. So, Anthony, good to see you, bro. Thanks for joining me today, my man. <laughs> Jeff, it's so, it's so good to be here. And as you mentioned, the people in our group, I know some of them are listening in today. Uh, so it's, it's just been such a, a joy, really, to get to know you and Kimmy and, and walk in the road with you guys and just really excited to, to be part of this as well. Yeah, I th thanks for doing this, man. Absolutely, absolutely. I come in, you know, just to talk about the red dot that your dad always talked about. You know, I come in excited and I also come in feeling, you know, a, a bit unqualified, quite frankly. You know, and uh, your dad would always say that's a really good evidence that you're going to depend a little more on the Holy Spirit. So that's uh, that's an encouraging thing. That's well, if that's if that's the beginning thing to depending upon the Spirit, I think we're both in a good place now because I feel I've felt unqualified since Dad passed away. Man, it's like what am I doing this stuff for? No, but no. I've just loved getting a chance to chat with people about his books, um, and it it gets me back into him. I can hear his voice talking. Um, and and a, a different kind of happiness. I, I remember we we actually went through. Uh, you know, I was I was part of the transcribing piece on that, which I, I mentioned earlier. And 
one of the things that was so fun, Anthony, was when he would say, what'd you think? Because he would never ask anybody opinions. He actually didn't want anybody reading uh, manuscripts before they were completed. Oh, wow. Because he didn't want to be, he didn't want to be influenced by their thinking. Yeah, I kind of remember that about him. And, and, but the only people, and he, it was actually my mom and myself, and I think my brother at times, but um, he would say, you know, I, I, I am open to your feedback. And mm -hmm. so we had a really neat opportunity to speak into some of that. And I remember as we were doing Battle for, or excuse me, Different Kind of Happiness, the title of the book, initially the working title was Battle for a Better Love. Mm -hmm. And you can see it all over the, 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 oh, book. the book. Yeah. I mean, he, he mentions that phrase time and time again in the book. And I remember too, that that's what it was going to be called. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's neat. And you know, what we were talking about before we just got on was um, your dad always valued relationship. He always valued the input of, of other people who are very close to him. And uh, that's partly what made him a, a powerful person. And partly what made him a powerful writer was that he, he was willing to, to dialogue about the things that he was writing. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe not while he was writing it, but, uh, but certainly later. Um, but I, that, you know, that's one thing I've always valued about your dad. Yeah. That he, uh, you know, he lived, he lived the relational journey. Yeah. Uh, he didn't just talk about it. He, he lived it. Well, it was cool as I was looking through the book. Um, you're one of the people that he dedicated this book to. Um, you know, I one of the about that until parents and directors at, uh, at the school. And um, so that was kind of cool. And when you and I were chatting about you joining me today, I just, I don't know, the last few weeks as we've kind of chatted through what we're going to talk about, I've been really excited about diving into this book with you. Um, what were some of the things that kind of stand out as, you, as we just start in on, on what different kind of happiness is all about? Well, you know, what, one of the things that immediately stood out to me, I, I always remember this book for the second half, which was the seven questions, but I had forgotten how much detail he spent on walking the narrow road. Mm -hmm. And the first half of the book is developing what it really means to walk the narrow road. And part one, the good news, that sounds bad. It's almost like what he's trying to do and what he did, I think very skillfully for me, um, is he helped me get in touch with a deeper appetite. Because as Christians, it's easy to, it's easy to walk the blessed life. You know, we get blessings, we, we get duped into thinking, well, you know, I'll do my part and then God will do his part. And, and normally that's kind of how we live. Uh, but your dad is obviously calling us to something else, something much deeper that, that is beyond living the blessed life. But it's something, you know, to walk the narrow road, when you hear that phrase, it's, it's almost like you hear that angry preacher who's standing on a pedestal and, you know, telling you to live certain ways or God's going to hate you. And, uh, Oh man, you know, that's just not what Larry's saying at all. You know, he, he wants to develop something that is so deep inside of us. Like we really do want to walk this road. And is there a way to actually develop an appetite, uh, like a deep thirst to walk on this road? That's the word. Yeah. That's the word thirst. Yeah. The word thirst. And so that, that, that immediately stuck out to me and he had mentioned it several times at the beginning just how we need to develop a thirst for walking the road. It's, it's actually in us. Every person who calls themselves a Christian, who has the spirit of God living inside them, has deep in their soul this, this longing or this thirst to actually walk this road. And I think that's essential to, to embracing or at least trying to embrace what he's how do you, trying. How do you release that thirst, Anthony? That was always something dad talked about. Yeah. You know, releasing what's deepest inside of us. How do we get most of us try to, I think, avoid that. We do. Or, or anesthetize that or whatever it may be. But how do you get in touch with that that really reveals that thirst? And I know a lot of it's through this book. I mean, as dad unpacks a lot of how do you how do you do that? What are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah. 
Um, I think a big part of discovering that thirst, it's, it's very counterintuitive, but he spends a lot of time on this actually. He talks about Romans 7, how we long to live a certain way, just like Paul did, and yet he saw sin right there with him. It's almost like you have to come into the reality of we really don't walk this road very well. And sin is, sin is a real problem and it's relational sin that's the biggest problem. And when we get in touch with that a little more, we see how it permeates our lives. And uh, I think actually the counterintuitive part of this is, is realizing that we don't walk it very well and therefore, we end up longing for it more. Hmm. And he has a quote, if I can find it here. It is our thirst to live well that frees us to walk the narrow road, not our success in loving well. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally counterintuitive. <laughs> so on one level, we, we really have to come to the realization that we don't walk it very well. And well, we love really need the, the dependence of the Holy Spirit, you know, to depend on the Spirit, to, to, to learn to walk it well. I love the, I love the, the, the chapter on, do, do, we, do you even know if you're on the narrow road? You know, some of, some of the titles of, of, of the chapters were just really, I, I loved them as, as I went back and reviewed it. And, um, but yeah. how do you know that you're on the narrow road? And, and just kind of going off that, the next book that we're producing that we're in the process of doing right now, and hopefully it'll be done at some point pretty quickly here, um, is, is titled Off Track. It's another manuscript that dad left us that really dovetails off of a lot of the stuff in this book really, really well. So I'm excited to do that. But you talk about, you know, we, we actually asked this question in our group, you know, the other day, and this is one that um, has kind of been, you know, kind of sticking with me here. What, is it, what does it mean to put Jesus on display? by how we relate and, and by, by, as, as we're walking the narrow road, what are your thoughts on that, bro? How to put Jesus on display. Oh my gosh. I, I knew you were going to ask that question because we had talked about it. And, uh, uh, you know, I will say that that's a battle. You know, we've, we've talked about the other title that your dad used for this book that it was originally going to be battle for a better love. And man, that's a battle to put Jesus on display. My mind immediately goes to relationally on display. What does that mean? Um, I, I, I think it, as I think about it for my own journey, I, I need to be aware of the battle in the present moment. We, we all need that. Mm. We, we, we have to have some understanding of how that battle is raging right now in our souls. Even as you and I are talking, how is that battle going on inside of us? And discerning what might be uh, a fleshly comment and discerning what might be something that might come from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it, it, it really takes knowing where you are in the present moment. And I know your dad was big on that. He called it red dot reflection. Um, you know, you go to a mall, you don't know where you are. You go to the map, there's the, the red dot. I know the listeners probably know this, but, and it says you are here. So, you know, where, where are we right now in this moment? And um, how can I follow the spirit? Hmm. In the moment, I, I think that's a very important question. And I think that's what Dad did so well. What's that? I think that's what Dad did so well was was did. being in tune with the Spirit and the rhythm of the Spirit. It's funny because as we think about this, you know, most people who who knew Larry Crab wouldn't equate him with happiness. And he even talks about that a little bit in the book, <laughs> saying, you know, hold it, this doesn't seem like your normal theme here, Larry. You're more about something else. But he really was joyful and happy and he even talks about the, the the difference between happiness and joy and i think in that chapter that he unpacks that and kind of the conclusion of that chapter from what i got is 
at some level, they're, you know, we, we want to try to differentiate them. But when we talk about the happiness that Jesus experienced, even on the cross as he's fulfilling his purpose, it's just so difficult to wrap your mind around what is the definition of being happy? And is that different than joy? Is it the same? And what are your thoughts on some of that, man? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the love that Jesus calls us to is a suffering love. And uh, yeah, he brought that. He brought the cross up many times in the book. Um, is it possible that we actually have that same energy within us? I mean, if, if he was living through the energy of the Holy Spirit, then so can we. Yes. Um, and that's very encouraging. I told my wife that I felt two or three things as I read the book. One was terribly convicted by a lot of things and reminded over how difficult this battle can be to fight for a better love but also deeply encouraged that the Holy Spirit is in us and therefore we can love like Jesus loved. It's huge. It's huge. It's, it's just, huge. you know, what, what I love about dad, Anthony, that as you say that, that just, it, it, it you know, he, he, he was such a question asker. There's so many questions in this book that he asked. I mean, you know, and ones that, you know, what, uh, you know, why didn't, you know, he says to Jesus, why didn't you reveal, you know, the father to everyone? Why, why is that? Why is the narrow road few? And he says in the book that few are going to find it and even less are going to stay on it, you know, while they're fulfilling their purpose. Um, and, you know, other questions of what does it mean to deny yourself? He talked about that. Am I on the narrow road? There's a question. Well, what does it mean to be on the narrow road? What does it mean to put Jesus on display? by how we relate, like I asked you. And yeah. those are questions that I love that he just challenged us with. Well, and you mentioned that your dad asked questions and you mentioned the chapter, that the one chapter that I, I was probably most drawn to was, I'm drawn to the whole book, but- um, <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna but, say. I mean, but the, but, but the chapter where he says, am I in the narrow road? Yeah. And I think, I think it was so important for him to include that. And I'm so glad he did because he asked the questions along with us. And, you know, I asked that question all the way through the book. Am I on the narrow road? Really? You know, I mean, after, you know, he talks about denying yourself and, and all these different things, like gi giving up all that you own. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, how, am I really on this road, Lord? And, and for him to ask that question of himself, uh, you know, it just it it just reminded me of what a sojourner he was. Um, I, you know, the first time I, I ever heard Larry was when I was in seminary and uh, a lot of good came out of seminary. But I was third year. I was ready to get out because nothing was really touching my soul. And a lot of the questions I had weren't being answered or at least weren't being uh, addressed. Um, uh, and I heard Larry with my wife um, when he came to the seminary, and he allowed me to ask questions that that I didn't have all that much permission to ask. And because of that, I turned to Diana and said, you know, I'd like to go sit under this man mm. and hear more of what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. and I just talked to a guy just the other day. He's talking about his church experience. I'm not, this is not every church, but um, but he said in his church, the reason why he actually left his church was that he could never ask any questions. Hmm. He couldn't ask questions about his thoughts about God, his own struggles in his life. And uh, of course, you know, Larry gave us the freedom to ask the questions. And uh, that's just huge. That's a big part of this book. You know, you talk about the battle. And, you know, battle is obviously a huge theme throughout this manuscript. Um, matter of fact, it was the, the title of the book, the working title until it was changed. And I, I think initially, and this wasn't my thought, but kind of a, a side thought here is as I've read it now, again, in the last few weeks, a few times and um, just reviewed it, I'm not as upset about the title of different kind of happiness as I was when they changed it from the working title that it had before. Yeah. But I love the word battle because you were talking about the struggle, the, 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 the spirit flesh battle that we, they go into. And dad talked about in this book, the tale of two stories. And this has been really impacting to me. We just got done shooting the first digital course, uh, the, uh, pieces of it, um, 
little three to six minute vignettes uh, in Atlanta a few weeks ago. And um, it went really well. And one of the major, major themes that I think I really found in this book was that at every given moment, we're telling one of two stories, either God's larger story or Satan's false story. Mm-hmm. And that's been very convicting to me. What, what story am I telling right now when, when I'm chatting with you? What story am I telling when I'm chatting with my wife in a few minutes? And, you know, all those kind of things. And I found that to be really something that's, that's kind of guided me because I don't want to tell Satan's false story. Um, and it's, it's so easy and natural to do. Um, it seems. Yeah. A little it, bit for me. Yeah. It, it, it seems very natural. Um, you know, moments of defensiveness that come out of us seem quite reasonable for the most part. And, you know, and they're, you know, th- those are the source of many of my, my arguments with my wife, you know, and I, we get into them. We're like, wow, what, how are we speaking? And, where is this coming from? And, you know, what, you know, what is this defensiveness about? It's, it's much more than just insecurity. It's, uh, you know, you said it well, um, are we telling Satan's story? Yeah. Are, are we trying to protect? That sounds harsh. It, it does sound harsh. And it's, I think it's a lot of people would say it is harsh, but. Yeah. True. Yeah. It's a bit unsettling, uh, to think that we could actually do that, but, uh, but I think what I'd love to, I'm sorry, Anthony, go, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that's, you know, that really is what's going on. If we're, if we're reading the Bible and, and understanding the battle that come, comes through the apostles' words, you know, the fight is against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And all those three, all those three are doing their best to get us off the narrow road. Keep us away from God's larger story. And keep us away from God's larger story. So true. Yeah. What were you going to say? Well, I just, I just love the fact that, you know, what dad has always done is his, his emphasis at some level on, on sin, which of course has to then bring out the emphasis on grace um, and the, and the, and the, the grace of, of the cross. And, um, and, and, you know, when he starts to talk about Satan and he talks about Satan quite a bit in this book, he does. I think that one of the things that we've seen in a culture today is how can we, and I've said this to, I think you before, I've said this to you before, Anthony, but I I really am am feeling very strongly about it, is Satan's biggest tool is to look like a joke or a punchline or just not being very, you know, let's not take him seriously. He's a cartoon character, whereas he is the prince and power of the air of this world, and, um, and he's out to destroy us. I remember when my my now 21 year old son was uh, I think he wasn't even a year old yet, and we were having a dedication at my mom and dad's house. And my dad prayed, and I won't forget this, but he said he said, "Lord, there's someone out there who wants to destroy this child's soul." And he's talking about my son. I'm thinking, what? And just the seriousness of Satan, I think, is something that we try that we don't realize is we're in a war, we're in a battle, yeah. and this is a war for our souls. And, and, um, and Satan wants nothing more than to destroy that. So to be aware that he's out there and dad just takes it straight on. He talks about Satan in here and what Satan's trying to do and Satan's false story and be aware of it. Don't think Satan's hiding in the, in the shadows trying to keep undercover because, boy, he's doing everything he can to, to, to mess us up at every moment. Yeah, and I had forgotten until I reread the second half of the book where your dad takes time. Well, he unpacks the seven questions, right? Spiritual theology. But he also talks about how Satan would answer these questions. Yes. Yes. I love and, that part. And it's oh. uh, it's very revealing to how Satan does his best to, to distort what God is trying to say to us. I love the first one, if I can just mention it. Um, Satan wants us to think that that God is almighty. Now, Satan tells half truths. Is God almighty? Of course he's almighty. But what is the deepest part of God that he wants to display? Well, you have to look at the cross to find that. And what was Jesus doing on the cross? Well, he gave up his power. Jesus relinquished his power on the cross. So it can't be almighty. It can't be that can't be the, the central thing that God is 
showing on the cross. And when you say he gave up his power, he gave up his, his, his divine power in being a human. Is that what you're saying? Because I know that at any moment, you know, God, Christ went to the cross voluntarily. At any moment, he could have said, okay, I'm done with this. It's over. So it, it wasn't that his power was. No, no. I, I, guess, I guess a better way to say that would be he chose not to use his power. That's it. Yeah. He yeah. suffered for us. Yeah. He suffered for us. And at any time, he could have come off the cross, which makes the cross even more amazing. Oh. But the cross is about yeah. revealing the love of God on display. Yeah. That's centrally what, That's it. what the, the first question, who is God? Well, it's, it's the love of God that pays any price for, for us who, who need it. And that's, that's basically what's going on on the cross. Yep. So, uh, so, you know, these are nuances, but they're important nuances. Let me just real quickly for some of the people who are watching today, you've heard Anthony and I talking a lot about the seven questions of spiritual theology. These are questions that my dad came up with years and years ago. And basically what he said is, is, is that if, if the church you're, you're part of isn't dealing with one or multiple of these questions, you're probably not dealing with anything that really has any significance eternally. And so let me just tell you what these seven questions are. They're a big part of the book. They're part two. Uh, essentially, each, each chapter in part two deals with one of the questions. And so the seven questions are real quick, quickly these. Number one is, who is God? And he unpacks that in this book. What is God up to? What is he up to is question two. Question three are, who are we? Question four, what's gone wrong? Okay. Question five, what has God done? about our problem, about what's gone wrong. Yeah. Question six, how is the spirit working to implement the divine solution to our human problem? What's the spirit up to today? And you've heard us talk a lot this, this afternoon about following the rhythm of the spirit. That was something that, that, that dad did so well because he was, an open, he was open to the spirit's leading in ways that sometimes I, I feel like I am and I want more of it. And the last question is then, what we're talking about now is, how can we cooperate with what the Spirit's doing, with the Spirit's work? So those are the seven questions of spiritual theology that were created by Dad years and years ago. Um, and uh, he unpacks each one of those in a way that really kind of, um, I think, opens up some, some new thinking as you, as, you, as you live. These are things that actually change the way you live. Talk to that a little bit, Anthony. Yeah, and relational thinking. That's it. Uh, you know, just about relationship i i was taught in seminary you know he talks about in the book and i love this phrase that he uses you know, biblical theology and systematic theology those are normally what's taught in in seminary and those are great you know it's it's good to have those there you know there's it, it requires a lot of thinking uh in both those those categories biblical theology is is more about the theology in one book of the bible systematic theology is thematically who is god in the bible that kind of thing right but the the phrase that your dad uses in his book is spiritual theology mm -hmm. is taking biblical theology and systematic theology weaving them into a story that is to be told mm -hmm. and uh that is what spiritual theology is I love that. And I'd love for you to tell that story about Jim Houston. <laughs> well, dad's one of dad's mentors, um, uh, Dr. Dr. James Houston uh, at, uh, at Regent University up in Vancouver. He and dad have become, had become quite close. And dad was just uh, starting in on some things. And Dr. Houston is, who's turning 100 this year. Um, <laughs> so uh, he's, he's outlived dad. And I think he's pretty upset about it, by the way. Um, but uh, he said to dad, uh, was talking about spiritual theology, and dad said, well, I've heard about uh, all the other different kinds of theology, but I don't think I've heard what you're talking about. What is spiritual theology? And Dr. Houston very simply said, oh, it's the, it's the theology that actually makes a difference in someone's life. <laughs> dad thought, oh, I guess I better, I better get, a, get acquainted with this theology, but I love how you married the biblical and systematic in some ways, but the whole thing is relational. We, we, we got one person who's asking us some questions, and if you have any questions, Feel free at the bottom of the of the screen that you're watching. You see a Q&A button. Click on that Q&A button. But this is a tough question here. Um, someone asks here, 
that they have a 16 year old who is hearing Satan's voice 24 seven. What, what does he need to do? <laughs> How can we guide him to be the young saint he really is? And uh, what you're saying is helpful. And he's going to see this young man here in the next few minutes. And so he's wondering, what can we say about that? And I, you know, it's, it's interesting when I hear those questions, Anthony, I'll let you think about it for a second. Yeah. But I often think, what would dad say? How would dad respond to a question like this when a young, young man, 16 year old man yeah. is, um, is hearing Satan? What would you say to that? Oh, you know, I, I think what I'd want to do first and foremost is obviously ask more questions because there could be a lot of different things going on. Um, but I think what I would want, if we're talking in a spiritual direction kind of way, the first thing that comes to my mind is I would want this person to know that I'm walking with them and uh, that I'm, I'm not going to run away because they're going through something as difficult as hearing Satan speaking to them 24 uh, seven. And I would also want them to know that there is a deeper power. There's a deeper um, energy that comes from the Holy Spirit. And if this person is a Christian, that spirit resides at the center of his soul. And, and to kind of help him redefine not redefine, but cast some vision mm. for I love that who he really can be. Yeah. And and what God is up to in the depths of his soul. Because so many of us, don't we wonder at times if God is doing any work in us? You know, you know, and we just you, your dad talked about this a lot, you know, casting vision for people and, and believing for people when people cannot believe it for themselves. Gosh that the spirit of God is at work at the center of the soul. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's what keeps me going at the, at the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day, at the end of the day, to believe that there is a, a, a deeper power, a, a person, a person who defines the love between the father and the son. It's the Holy Spirit given to us by the father and the son. So, I mean, those are just a few thoughts on obviously a situation I don't know much about, but, but to cast some vision for him and help him understand that the spirit is real. Yeah. God loves him. So I love that too. That's, that is such a good point. You know, I mean, he's not alone. And I, I, no, I the no. thing that you said earlier, which, which, uh, which has been something that's just been first and foremost on my mind, uh, certainly since, since dad went home to be with Jesus is we have the spirit of Jesus in us. The Holy spirit is the spirit of Jesus. And that is just, I just, I, I can't, I can't tell you how big that is. And in, in, with that situation, Satan, you're powerless. You don't have power over us. You, you don't, we have the power of Jesus in us. And, and to, to understand that, that that's, you know, you use, you use a deeper power, way deeper. <laughs> I mean, you know, Satan just seems like, you know, you know, and, and I don't want to minimize Satan because I don't want to minimize him. Yeah. And he's a, he, he, he's the, 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 the creator of lies and the deceptor of all, but, um, but he we have the power of Jesus in this man. And he was defeated on the cross. Now that doesn't mean that all things have been made power. new. All things have been made new and, and, and God's going to get us there. Um, it doesn't mean we don't learn to fight this battle because this battle is very real. It it's really just, is. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a battle we can fight. And, uh, the, the thing I think I love about the seven questions is that, you know, it, it teaches me to, to, to ask these questions. Your dad used to say this a lot. When, when God is not answering your questions. Not asking the right one. Yeah. <laughs> start asking the questions that God has already decided to answer and has felt like are most important for us to address. And those are the questions that emerge from the 66 books of the Bible. Um, they emerge from there. Um, now, there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to the questions, but man, you know, it's so encouraging to hear what, what God says about his own questions. Yes. You know, the relational answers to those questions. And, you know, we, we start at this time praying, uh, you know, about Jesus. And uh, it seems like as we walk the narrow road, at least this is my experience, as I learn to walk it, and I fail to walk it, 
the thirst for it intensifies. And thirst within us is not a bad thing. And thirst, th the thirst to know God, to want community, for that thirst to intensify, that's a good thing. Yes. That's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and we want to live with that thirst. And, uh, and I would say as I've walked the narrow road, as I, and I, as I stumble on it, Jesus Christ has become more important to me. Knowing him, just knowing him, walking with him, he's become more important. Yeah. And uh, I think that was his intention. And that is his intention, that when we cross over the finish line, like your dad did, that we're going to be saying the same thing you, your dad said, you know, that uh, I'm coming home. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see him. See Jesus. I'm going to walk with him. And, and Jesus meant so much to your dad as he kept walking on the road. And I know he means a great deal to your mom as well. And just watching him and your mom walk together for Diane and I has been huge. And I think they learned to love each other in such a profound way, not without battle, of course, but because they both, Rachel and, and Larry together, learned what it meant to walk the narrow road for themselves. Yes. And that spoke volumes to Diane and I, and, and uh, still does, quite frankly, so. Yeah. So, yeah. This is this has just been yeah. so fun, man. I, yeah. I um, I hope you people get the get the book, a different kind of yeah. happiness. It's um, you know, one of the things that that he really does talk about a lot, um, in this book is is the the trials of this life, um, and 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 um, and how in the midst of those trials, you still have the opportunity to experience happiness and joy, and because because you're fulfilling the purpose that you were set here to fulfill. Um, and, and I love that in dad's smaller story, as I mentioned, his 76 year old smaller story fit into God's larger story in a way that has eternal value. Um, and he was experiencing that different kind of happiness because there was times where I would ask, why are you so miserable? You don't, you don't seem like you're very happy. You've got a lot of things to be happy for. <clears throat> he was aware that he wasn't built for this world and, um, and that this world just did not do it for him. And I'm starting to understand a little bit more of that. I'm, I'm understanding my dad through his readings, through, through what he said, that as a younger man who didn't face as many challenges as maybe I've faced now, um, I, under, I understand him a little bit better. I really appreciate where he was and how he, how he stayed true to the end and focused on Jesus and how he represented Jesus to others. He did to me. I know he did to you too, Anthony. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah. I think we've got one more question perhaps here. Let me see what we've got here. Okay. Um, you know, before we go, um, why don't, Anthony, could you just pray for this young man that's going to be, be getting talked to here in the next little bit by this guy? His name's, his name's Angel. And, um, and if we can just close down and then, um, and then we'll wrap up. And, but if you could just lead us in a, in a word of prayer as we're, as we're closing down today, for, especially for Angel as he's battling some, some demons in his life. Yeah. Let's pray. Um, oh, Lord, um, we lift up this, this young man, Angel, to you. Lord, we don't know uh, in what ways Satan is speaking to him, but that's got to be terrifying um, on, on so many levels. It's got to be disheartening on so many levels. Lord, is it possible that you're allowing him to struggle with this so he discovers you more? I think that's what you're about. And I, I just pray for him that he would discover you in the middle of this a bit more. That, that he would know that you are with him and that you are for him. Mm. Yes, Lord. And that and that you love him. You love him, Lord Jesus. And that you you, you want to touch his soul. You want him to know that that you are are there. Mm -hmm with him and for him and, and, and help him to know uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit inside his own soul. Maybe if it's not a felt present, may he be able to trust 
that somehow the Holy Spirit is working. Yes, Lord. And uh, is working through this difficult, difficult time. And whoever is speaking to him, pray for discernment to speak into this gentleman's life. We lift him up in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, everybody, thanks for joining us today. And um, if you haven't gotten a different kind of happiness, go to largerstory.com and order it. And then if you haven't gotten a copy of Listen In by my mom, by Sonia Reeder, and by Diana Calvin, get a copy of it as well. Um, this will be what we chat about next week. Anthony, brother, it's been so good to talk to you, man. Thanks for, thanks for joining me today. This has been fun. It's been an honor. It's been so fun. Thank you for having it, me. This has been very easy. We're definitely going to be uh, doing this again. And all of you who joined us today, thanks for joining us. Have a safe weekend and have a great Mother's Day. We'll see you on May 26th to talk about listening. God bless. God bless.